All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. My name is Aaron Dickinson from Showing Time. Some of you may remember me from when I was a practicing agent in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Uh, glad to be here with everyone today and want to uh, get right into things. We're going to be talking about InfoSparks today and walking through the InfoSparks tool, looking at some usage examples, some caveats, and frequently asked questions. And of course, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to send those in. And myself or someone else on our team will do our best here to answer that. And so we're going to get right into things here and uh, look. So to um, access InfoSparks, there's a number of ways to do so. And I will walk through all of the different integrations uh, in a few minutes. But I want to uh, start off here with a demo of the tool. So InfoSparks is something that allows agents to visualize the housing market at a regional level, as well as at a very local and very segmented level. So basically we can look at that 50,000 foot view of the housing market and drill all the way down into what's going on in specific neighborhoods and in different types of homes and price points and, and whatnot. So uh, when we first log into InfoSparks, we're typically going to be looking at the Twin Cities region as a whole. And at the bottom, we have a whole bunch of metrics and visualizations that we can walk through. But I want to show you how you can navigate into something more specific if you're looking to pull the stats down. Um, and so I want to do a quick check here and see, are people seeing uh, my screen? We can, Aaron, but it looks like you might, it's like in presentation view. So I'm seeing your next slide as well. It's not like full screen. Got you. I have the wrong screen being shared. My apologies. No, it's All okay. Right. Uh, how about there we go? Now? Perfect. <laughs> All, right. All set. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, so here we are. We've got InfoSparks. It's cool. We can do a lot with it. We're going to start off here by looking at how we can drill into a specific area. So in the upper left hand corner is our area selection tool, and we can. Um, scroll through a list of available areas and there's a ton. Uh, we can filter this list down based off of the type of area we're looking for. And we can look at any of these MLS provided areas, counties, neighborhoods, communities, cities, school districts, and postal codes. We also have the ability to draw our own custom areas. And I'll show you that a bit later. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna come in and I'm going to pull up St. Paul. And so when I uh, type in St. Paul and select it, you may have noticed that the chart below was updated. And that's the nice thing here with InfoSparks is anytime you make any uh, selection changes to your settings, you're going to see the chart uh, refresh to reflect those settings. So now I'm looking at just this median sales price for properties sold in St. Paul, but I can further narrow this down based off of some other criteria. I can filter things by price range, property type, construction type, seller type, square footage, and bedrooms. And then if I scroll here to the right, I can also filter based off of waterfront type. So for example, let's come in here and say, I wanna look at single family, previously owned, uh, 1,500 to 2,000 square feet, three bedroom properties. And let's say I want, uh, Waterfront. Well, guess what? There isn't any waterfront in St. Paul, any waterfront properties in St. Paul. There is waterfront, obviously, uh, with the river, but uh, so there is no private waterfront. There is a couple of properties that have had water access, but I intentionally wanted to show you what these look like when you've gone too far down the filtering path and you've just simply created something that rarely exists in nature. There's nothing wrong with the chart, but the chart is certainly broken simply because there's only a few properties that have sold in the last few years that have any kind of water access. And so consequently, you get something like this. So when you see a broken chart like this, this is telling you that there's just simply too few properties that match your criteria. So when I pull off that waterfront types, we certainly have a much um, nicer uh, chart here. And in general, uh, what you want to do is while you do have all these filters available, you want to be careful not to get so specific that um, the chart starts to 
to not make a lot of sense. If you see sharp, jagged moves, or if you see an incomplete chart like we just saw, that's telling you your sample size is quite small. And so you may want to back off a filter. You don't want to be as precise as you would be in a CMA, because in a CMA, you're really trying to narrow it down to like the half dozen properties that most closely match the subject. With InfoSparks, we, we need not a handful, we need dozens or hundreds of properties to give you a proper trend over time. And so you wanna be a little bit broader in your terms than you would be with a, a CMA. Uh, so let's dig into a little bit more here. Uh, say you wanna look at more than one of these filter options at a time. So for example, you wanna look at both single family and townhouse. You can add the townhouse button uh, or option right by clicking this uh, button here on the right. Um, or we can hit the split at the top here and then split them out into individual lines. So you can compare and contrast the trends, for example, here with single family and townhouse um, and their pricing over time. We can also customize a couple of these. The price range and square footage range filters can be customized to create your own ranges and to run stats on those individual ranges or in combination. And so now I've got my individual ranges. And so you can see, I do have a little bit more um, detail into the charting because I'm working with narrower path or narrower groups of uh, square footages. And here, if I'm comparing square footage between these two different ranges, we can see how the pricing varies between them. But wait, there's more. We can also compare multiple areas together using the add an area button here at the top, I can add up to three additional locations to use for comparison. And so in each one of these tabs, you would simply choose the other location that you would like to use for comparison. And you can use any combination of cities, counties, communities, whatever you'd like. Uh, they do not have to be all the same type. So uh, this comparison might seem a bit odd, but I'm doing it to show you just the fact that it's got that flexibility. You can chart any type of area to any other type of area. So while you can do up to four areas at a time, I think this can oftentimes be counterproductive. I'm a big fan of less is more. And in a lot of uh, the charts that you do, they're not going to behave this cleanly. They're, you know, where the lines are nice and separated and you can see pretty clear uh, trends over time. In many cases, if you tried to do this with some of the stats, the lines will all crisscross and they'll, they're just hard to follow when you've got that much information. So I'm a huge fan of comparing one area to another. Uh, or one area to a region as a whole. I think that comparison just keeps things simple, keeps, th keeps things clean. The second thing to keep in mind is that when adding an additional area for comparison, that tab is going to become the active tab as we see here with the Twin Cities region selected. And whichever tab is active and uh, the filters you see applied at the top, those filters are being applied to everything that you see uh, charted at the bottom and new tabs will always start off with zero filters. So currently we're looking at all of the sales in the Twin Cities region versus all of the sales in St. Paul. If I wanted to look simply at the condo sales in these two regions, I can choose that as well. Um, or if I'd like to, I can go back to my original set of filters by clicking on the first tab, which says St. Paul. And you'll see here that single family previously owned three bedroom filters are applied. And so that is again, applying to everything you see at the bottom. Uh, so that's how we can drill into specific areas. Now I'm going to zoom back out here to a Twin Cities region view and going to um, walk you through the metrics and the visualizations that we can do. And again, we can do this with any geography from uh, big to small. Uh, it's so the options are endless. And with InfoSparks, I'm a big fan. You come in and you push buttons and you learn things. There's so much to be um, absorbed from just simply viewing this data in different perspectives and kind of then taking those charts and going, okay, how does that translate into what I've experienced in the real world practicing with my buyers and sellers? Uh, so on the bottom here is our metrics. We've got a whole bunch of them here. 
We're going to start off looking at median sales price. Um, so we have the options for median or average as well. Um, I'm a big fan of using median. The big difference here is that um, median will always report or almost always report a lower number, but I feel it's a more reflective number of the actual activity in the market. What the median means is that if you were to sort all of the home sales prices from highest to lowest or lowest to highest, either way, and then find that sale that's right in the middle where half are selling for more, half are selling for less, that is your median sales price. So it is the middle sale, uh, the median on the freeway, it's in the middle of everything. And that means that you're getting the property that's that's most reflective of, of that center of the whole market. Now with average, what'll happen is average can be skewed by sales at the very high end and at the very low end. And so way back in the day when we had foreclosures and we had some that were selling for literally three to 5,000 a piece, an average um, was skewed down because a lot of those sales. And today with some of the McMansions and the, the estates that sell, those, you know, if they're selling at five or 10 or 20 million, those can skew the numbers to the high end. And so with a median, you have less of that skew. So I, that's why I, I've always preferred that median uh, price. Uh, but we can look at this data in some other ways here. So first thing we can do is we can change our time frame. We can go from the one year view, which is last year plus the current calendar year, or we can go and do a longer period as well. And we can use Max to go back in the Twin Cities here to 2005, which is fabulous because it gives you, um, what, 18 years here of sales and a long-term perspective in the different cycles in the market. And so um, being able to see those long-term trends and put into context what's going on today, you know, the past isn't a guarantee of the future, but there's some things that are similar today as, as to what we saw in the last boom and bust cycle. Uh, and then there are sharp differences here as well. So um, we are currently looking at this in the default view, which is the rolling 12 month view. And what this means is that the data that we're seeing is averaged um, over the last 12 months to give you the value that you're looking at. So in this case, when we're looking at the median sales price, we're looking at the median sales price for the last 12 months is 365,000, up 1.4% from the 12 months prior. Uh, so what does this do when we're looking at this in a rolling 12 month view? We're smoothing out trends, we're eliminating seasonality and short-term volatility. And you definitely can see the, the ebbs and flows in the market and the steady, you know, once we hit bottom, the steady trend of pricing up. And then you know, do, do notice a little bit here that pricing seems to kind of accelerate during COVID, but then it's certainly been flat for almost the last two years now. And we can get that sense here in that rolling 12 month view pretty clearly. Now, the other view that I want to make sure that you're aware of is the monthly view. And so this is where we actually look at the uh, all of the activities specifically just for the month that it's reported in. So in this case here, we're in early November and InfoSparks updates every night through the end of the month prior. So we are showing data through October in the report. And so for October, the median sales price was 365 and that's up 2.5% from a year ago. And we can go back here to the October view to see that. Um, and so in that monthly view here, we see all of that seasonality. We see all of that short-term volatility. Um, and so um, we can uh, uh, certainly get a little bit of a different perspective here because um, with most of the data, there is seasonality and there is short-term volatility. So seeing it in both ways, I think is beneficial. In this view, the fact that prices have uh, kind of been peaking for the last year, or at least flattening out, um, that is a little bit less easy to see than it was in the rolling 12 month. Um, but each view has its own um, it, perspectives and takeaways. And, you know, I could sit and debate with you what each one of these tells us. And we may, we may each have a little different takeaway from this. Um, so let's walk through some of the other metrics here. Uh, so we've been looking at median sales price, but 
I want to come in and want to look at the buyer activity first. So we've got pending sales. And so in pending sales, we're looking at properties that go under contract. And we can see in the seasonal view here, a couple of interesting events. Uh, going back to 2010, there was the first time home buyer tax credit. And the um, that was an interesting year. Uh, so the Fed said, hey, if you first time home buyer, you buy a house and you get under contract by April and close by, I think it was June or July, uh, you'll get $10,000 in the tax credit. And so everyone who could buy bought the first half of the year. And then market was pretty quiet the second half of the year. There wasn't a lot going on that year. Uh, so we could see that there. Uh, you could see the first month of COVID when the world didn't know how to do uh, anything, much less real estate in a pandemic. So uh, for a month, there was a blip in buyer activity. And then all of a sudden, buyer activity zoomed higher. Uh, you can also sometimes see things like uh, weather events. In some parts of the country, hurricanes can affect the metrics as well. So it's kind of interesting in this month of view, you get some of those kinds of special events. Um, but the big things here that I thought were interesting is, uh, you know, again, I think context is is beneficial. And so looking at um, long term things like, for example, uh, December of last year, uh, pending sales were very low. They were at their lowest point in more than a decade. And we'd have to really go back here because it was even lower than here. Um, you know, we have to go back to 2007 to a lower period of pending sales in the month of December. So it was a pretty, um, pretty sharp drop from previous year's activity. And we see how this year's activity is much lower than it has been for many years. And we can see that perspective also too here is more simplified, more streamlined in the rolling 12 month view. And so uh, here we see that the activity for buyers, again, this was for many years, was pretty consistent. Then we see the COVID period spike, and we see not only the retreat from COVID, but we are now back down to uh, much, much lower levels of buyer activity, uh, levels that haven't been seen in more than 10 years. Um, however, buyer activity on annualized basis is still stronger than the lowest periods that we have here in this record. So that context is important. Uh, this is a great way too, if you're a newer agent, to kind of get a sense for, you know, what's happened in the history of real estate and and those times in that period over time. Uh, so there's certainly, uh, you know, this is a slower time for buyer activity, but it's not the slowest time on record by far. All right, so let's go and look at um, new listings. So this is seller activity. The other side of the coin here, we see seller activity is down this year, but it's actually only down 1% from a year ago. And if we go back and look at that rolling 12 month view again, we can see that on an annualized basis, seller activity is down sharply from where it was pre-COVID and also at its low for the last 18 plus years here that we're charting. So um, sellers have not participated as much. There's a lot of golden handcuffs out there. I've got a lot of friends and past clients who are in at that three, 4% mortgage rate. And they're like, I'm not leaving until uh, <laughs> until the rates drop or I'm dead. You know, And so uh, because of that, with a lot of people who have just decided they're just not going to sell right now. Um, and because inventory is, is tight as well, there's not as much for them to go and move into as well. So for those reasons, seller activity has backed off pretty strongly. And we can see that in homes for sale. And so inventory uh, remains very low. It's actually down 7.3% from where it was a year ago. And it's basically at its lows um, over the last multiple, uh, well, but two decades here. So inventory remains very tight. Uh, and so while buyer activity is lower than it was a year ago, and it's substantially lower than where it was a few years ago. And we've seen seller activity lower, inventory remains very constrained in your market. And because of that, um, we're going to see that month's supply remains pretty low as well. We're at 2.3 months of supply. That's up a bit from last year, but it's still um, near the lows that we've been seeing over the last many years. 
Um, and as we talked about before, you know, just going back and refreshing memory here on price, even though buyer activity is substantially lower than it's been for many years, uh, because inventory is tight, because so many sellers have chosen not to go on the market, the prices have remained very strong and they are up slightly from a year ago. Uh, all right, so let's look at a couple other metrics here. Uh, days on market, this will track fairly similarly to the month supply trends. And so days on market still rem remains pretty darn low, less than three weeks to sell a home. Uh, and uh, I like to look here at percent of original price. Um, this one I found quite insightful. Um, this is a good indicator for just how strong of a buyer's or seller's market um, that we're in. And so um, there's two different ways to look at this. There's the median and there's the average. And so for this metric, um, I do like to look a little bit more at, well, I look at both of them. I still am a big fan of median, but with the median um, for this metric, it'll it'll top out at that 100% pretty commonly because uh, for the median to go above 100%, that means more than half of homes had to sell for over asking. And that's that's a huge lift. That's, that's a hard thing to have happen, more than half of homes going over asking price. If we look at this chart, in fact, we can see it hadn't happened until uh, we entered COVID. And then in the peaks here of COVID in June of 2021, when buyer activity is strong and in, um, in what is it, May here of 2022, you were at 102, 103% of asking um, as the median sale. So the typical sale went for that. Unbelievable. Um, that, that, it's those are some of the stronger numbers I've seen in the country. There are a couple, I think, a couple markets that hit like 104, 105%, but very, very unusual. So unusual, you know, there is no historical precedence for it in our data going back to 2005. And so uh, we can see how, um, though, that the story really changed in the second half of 2022 as rates started to rise. And all of a sudden, um, buyers started to get a little bit of negotiating power back, right? So um, they got back to that historical level where they, you know, in the end of part of each year, where buyers typically had a little bit more negotiating room uh, than they did in the other periods of the year. So we saw that happen again in 2022. And as we're looking at 2023 here, uh, we see this year is kind of looking a little bit more like the previous years where hey, the typical home still, still selling for asking price. So it's still a very good seller's market, but it's not quite as hot as it was a couple of years ago. Um, and so I also do like to look at the average here though, simply because the average gives a little bit more fidelity into the in, um, detail into the, the severity of the seller's market when it comes to um, the percentage of sales price. So when looking at average, we don't see those flat tops. We see a little bit more uh, detail here in the curves. So, so the story is still pretty similar, but here we can see that uh, there is a little bit more of a peak and a trough here in, um, in the average when we look at it in this way. So I'm again, I'm a big fan of coming in and pushing buttons and you get a different perspective when you look at that data in different ways. Uh, so translating that into how could you use this with a customer uh, as a seller, it's a way to help explain things like seasonality and like Mr. Seller this time of year, we should be expecting that we may have to negotiate a bit more on price. And then same thing on the buyer side, uh, you know, buyer, uh, you know, here's some of these trends, but you, you you seem to think you can get 20% off a house. That's just not happening very often. Uh, you know, there's a couple of times where a house is severely overpriced, but the rest of the time you got to pay, you know, close to asking because that they're market priced homes. So this can help support, you know, maybe trying to get that unrealistic buyer back up into a little bit more realism. Uh, so this is, you know, certainly good education for yourself as an agent, but also great for uh, working with your buyers and sellers. And then uh, dollar volume, I want to talk on this one just very briefly. So when we talk about the fact that sales are down sharply, uh, 
we know that that does affect uh, revenues for agents and brokerages and everyone in the industry. Uh, but I wanted to give you a little perspective here with dollar volume. So this is the Twin Cities region still. And this is looking at an annualized basis, um, the sales activity over the last 12 months here. Oh, what, 19 billion in transactions. Now it's down 20% almost from a year ago. But if we exclude COVID, you're basically back to pre-COVID levels of annualized sales dollars uh, in the Twin Cities area. So there's probably some more agents than there were pre-COVID, uh, but membership will probably be declining a bit in the next one to two years uh, due to the shifts in the market. That's very common to see that as the market shifts, that eventually agent counts um, decline in a softening market. And so... Um, there's still a lot of money out there. There's still a lot of uh, transactions happening. So yes, that activity is lower, dollar volumes lower than it was a year ago. But it on a historical basis, if we excluded the last three years of sales, this would still be close to a record year of sales dollar volume in the Twin Cities. So again, context I think is helpful. Uh, a couple more metrics, and then we're going to get into some details on how to use these charts. So um, we've got our shows to pending stat. This is the first number we're going to look at, and I am going to make sure I'm looking at this in a monthly view because the seasonality is very important. Uh, this is using showing time showing data, and we're taking whatever filters you've applied at the top, and then we're narrowing it down to just the properties that had showing time enabled during the listing period, which is the most, uh, the majority of them, but there are a few listings that do not use showing time. Uh, and so looking at that list, how many showings does it take for the typical property to go from active to pending status? In other words, how many showings to sell a home? So this can be beneficial to help set expectations with a seller up front. It can also be beneficial as a kind of a guidepost on the path to selling a home. Uh, if you've hit three weeks on the market, and remember our median DOM was 20 days right now. So if you've hit that three weeks in the market and no offers, if you've hit eight or nine or 10 showings and no offers, it gives you the opportunity to go back to talk to the seller and say, Mr. Seller, you know, this time of year, uh, typically homes are selling in about that three weeks with about eight or nine showings. We have not had any offers yet. Now might be a good time to consider making some adjustments to the listing to make sure that we get this property sold before it gets even cooler and uh, activity gets even softer here over the holidays. And so might be a way for you to get that price reduction to help make sure to get that property sold this year. The shows per listing stat is also based off of the showing time showing data. And this is telling you how many showings are happening per listing per month. And this can be excellent to help you understand, is it me or the market? And what I mean by that is, say you've got a listing, it's been on for a month or two. Uh, you know, you got that first little surge of, of showing activity when it was just listed. But now you maybe you've had one showing or no showings in the month of October. Well, are there buyers out there? <laughs> you know, what's going on? Is is you know is it me and just something with my listing, or are there truly no other buyers in the market? So with this, if I had applied my filters at the top for something similar to my subject listing, I could benchmark against it and go, well, the typical property like mine got 4.3 showings last month and we had one. Okay, so there were three buyers or more that were out there, looked at other things, but they didn't look at our house. So that's another data point you can take back to the seller and go, Mr. Seller, uh, there were multiple buyers that saw your home online, but rejected the listing online and didn't schedule a showing. They went to these other listings instead. So let's make some adjustments to your listing to make sure that it's as appealing as possible to the consumer online so we can get those showings because showings equals offers. So another way that you can help educate that seller and maybe move them in price or condition, or maybe it's new staging or uh, new seasonal photos, et cetera, uh, to make sure that that listing gets sold so you get that commission check yet this year. All right. So We've gone through a lot of different metrics and whatnot. I wanna walk through one more thing and that's a visualization in a bar chart format. Uh, so we've been looking at the line charts so far. We can also look at bar charts. They can do up to three years of history. 
And where it gets really interesting is when you have a split at the top here, it's a whole different way to visualize those trends and compare and contrast um, different areas or different segments of the market here. So here I'm looking at sales price and splitting those up between the three property types. Let's see percentage of original price and see, okay, they're pretty consistent across them, but condos are just a bit softer. Uh, so it's just a different way to visualize this data. And so again, come in, push buttons, you'll get different takeaways as you do so. All right, so uh, let's go back to this price chart here showing the trend over time on the three different property types. Uh, I've got this chart, I wanna do something with it. What are my options? The first thing I can do is hit the print button. This is going to give me a PDF uh, file of the chart. There's some agent branding at the top and I'll show you how you can customize that in just a couple minutes. Then we've got our chart below. If we have any filters applied, that'll show up here in the bottom. Uh, it's also going to tell us if we're looking at this in a monthly or rolling period view that the report was run today and where the data came from. So that's the print format. The share button gives us some options here to share it electronically. First question we're asked is, do we want a static chart or a live chart? The static chart is a snapshot in time. It'll show us exactly what we see today if we come back next week or next month. Instead, with the live chart, we will get an updated chart every time we access it. We update InfoSparks every night through the end of the month prior. So if you choose the live chart option and you come back to this chart in December, it'll show you the November sales activity in it. So in most cases, I think a live chart is best simply because you're always seeing the most current data available. However, there could be a situation where you're citing the number of sales in a given month. And maybe in that case, you do not want uh, the chart to change because it wouldn't match your existing uh, commentary. We can share it out in different ways. Let's look at the social media and email share. When I click the share button, I get a URL that I can use wherever I want. But if we hit and view new window, we can take a look. It looks similar to the PDF. However, now we have some mouse over interactivity because this is a web page, not a PDF. There's also some shortcuts up here at the top that allow us to quickly share out to Facebook and uh, Twitter X and wherever else we want. We can download the PDF from the upper right. From the bottom, we can download a PNG of the chart. We can also download a CSV file. This would give us the values that make up the chart and would allow us to create our own chart styles and types. However, it does not export MLS numbers or addresses or any other listing level data, just the values of the chart. And then the final thing we can do is bookmark this URL. Uh, if I have charts that I like to use regularly in my buyer presentations and my listing presentations uh, for quoting in my blog or just for my own personal reference, if I bookmark those live chart URLs in my browser, I can go directly back to my browser bookmark. I don't have to log back into the MLS to access it. And then we can also embed these charts into our own website or blog. You can do that as a picture or as an interactive version. Choose the size you want, create a custom size, then you get a snippet of code and you would grab the entire snippet of code and copy and paste that into your website's HTML. And you get this chart with some interactivity, but imagine the rest of your website's content around this chart. So it makes it very easy for you to have stats on your website and have those updated for you automatically. So you can set it and forget it. All right, so if you have questions on using InfoSparks, we have a few resources. First of all, you can click the tool tip on the upper right, and that's gonna give you a little um, icon or a little tool tip here for each of the buttons and what they do. Uh, in the user manual and FAQ, we have a lot more detail. We have a short demo video of it, uh, contact information to reach out to North Star MLS if you need more assistance. And then you can navigate through the manual, a couple of key sections here. The metric section talks more about the metrics and how they're calculated. And then the sharing section talks about shared charts. Do note that charts will eventually expire if they're not periodically accessed. And the details on that are located in the highlighted section here. Also at top is the profile section. This is where I can upload my agent photo or logo and update the contact information that displays on the charts. Just make sure to hit the update profile button at the bottom to save your changes. 
And then finally, it's the My Area section. This is where I can come in and draw my own custom area and then um, use that for um, for stats purposes. So I can navigate in wherever I want and draw my shape. Once I've got a closed up polygon like that, I can grab any of the corners here and make adjustments if I'd like to. I can also use the draw circle button here at the top to draw a circle around a point. You can have multiple shapes, delete shapes if you make a mistake. And then once you've got the area you want, you can save it and name it. Um, and just know that whatever you name it here will display on anything that you share out. So keep that in mind. As I save it, it'll think for a minute, tell me how big of an area I have and how many listings are in it. The same caveat applies here in terms of sample size. If you draw an area that's very small or you draw a very rural location, the numbers might be pretty minimal. So here we've got 8,600 listings, but that's going all the way back to 2005. So that's a good sample size. But if that were instead like 86, that'd be what, a few sales a year. So uh, just keep in mind, it, low sample size, you can still chart it. It'll just, the chart's gonna look a little weird because there's not a lot of data there. Uh, but this is certainly a, a lot of data. So when I hit the C stats link here, we're going to look at my new East Bloom geography. And I can chart this and slice and dice this just like I could any other area in the MLS. And if I want to come back to this saved area in the future, I go to my drop down in the upper left and go to the My Area section. And I can pull up any previous area I've created and run those stats again. All right, so to summarize here with InfoSparks, we can drill into details. We can look at that 50,000 foot view at a regional level, but we can also filter by geography, filter by the types of properties selling and drill into something very specific and look at that in line charts and bar charts, look at it in 18 plus years of sales history, look at it in a monthly or rolling period view. Uh, we can review all those different metrics. We can customize some of the filters. We can create our own custom areas and make charts that are great for sharing. If there are any questions, please feel free to send those in. We've got just a couple of minutes left here in the webinar. Want to show you some usage examples. You can use this to uh, put stats pages on your website. Use those embedded shared charts to have those um, live on your site and have them updated automatically. You can use this to create content around a specific listing, show the trends in the area. You can use this to compare and contrast different segments of the market, new construction versus existing, single family versus condo and townhouse. Uh, you can compare and contrast different communities, show how the pricing and affordability is different between them. Uh, you can create a ton of content, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, Twitter X, you name it, whatever comes out next week to, to advertise on. The idea here is, there's so much information that could be provided. There's so many different stats. You can pick a couple of metrics, talk about what's going on in the market, talk about some of your own recent uh, experiences and use that as an excuse to stay top of mind with your sphere. You're educating them and informing them. Hopefully you're giving a little bit of entertainment or, edu uh, or something else of interest to, to keep them coming back and you're staying top of mind. And you can also help dispel any media myths that might be out there about what's going on in the housing market. When the media talks about the market, normally they're talking about the national housing market. Well, guess what? None of your buyers or sellers live or work or sell or buy in the national housing market. So real estate is local. You need a local expert. That is you. And demonstrate your value to them, educate them, correct them on misunderstandings. You know, uh, the media, the, the housing market is always either on fire or it's on fire, you know, one way or the other, it's always going to be sensationalized. What's going on local is maybe a little bit less uh, exciting, maybe a little more boring, but can be all that much more in, uh, valuable, insightful. So uh, do your best here to keep your sphere up to date as to what's going on locally in the markets that they live and work in. And uh, then when they're thinking about buying or selling, they're naturally going to think of you because you've been there messaging with them educating them all along. The data we get for these reports comes from the MLS. It's the gold standard. We've all gotten those notice to correct a listing at some point or another, or I think most of us have. Part of the reason that the MLS does that is because good data in means good reporting out. And so the MLS is rich, it's accurate, it is current, um, it is the gold standard. 
it is fabulous and that's where all of our data is coming from, except for those showing metrics, which we get from showing time itself. And then we update InfoSparks nightly through the end of the prior month. Keep in mind the first couple of days of each month, the data is going to be slightly incomplete because not everything's been completed from the previous month. So I usually suggest waiting till about the fourth or the fifth before I worry about things like uh, pending sales and closed sales. Those have a tendency to shift the, the most in the first couple of days each month. Um, and then we do update historical data all the way along. So every night we're updating through the prior month. Uh, the rolling 12 month view is the default in your market. That means you're looking at things kind of on a smooth annualized basis. It's a great way to understand the overall trends in the market but you wanna also look at that monthly view because you wanna see what's going on right now and to see that seasonality and short-term volatility or near-term changes in the market. So make sure you're looking at both because they have different takeaways. All right, so how to access. We've got a lot of access points in Northstar. Um, in the member dashboard, we've got an icon right there underneath the showing time icon. Uh, inside of Matrix, there's links in the external links section and also on property detail pages. Uh, in Flex MLS, it's available under the menu and under products. And in Paragon, it's in resources and it's labeled InfoSparks there. So lots of ways. There may be a couple more that I did not catch and put into the presentation. Uh, you can also access the tool inside of Showing Time itself under the report section. And then every showing confirmation email you receive at the very bottom will also have an InfoSparks chart. So many, many ways to get into the tool. Now, if you're a big data nerd like me and you compare numbers from InfoSparks directly to the MLS, they may not match exactly. If they're off by a couple, don't worry about it. Uh, every tool reports data slightly differently. If they're off significantly, 99% of the time, that's because you're not comparing apples to apples. So double check your filters. Uh, and then we also do a tiny bit of data scrubbing. If a property just has some stat that's just way out of line, we'll exclude that metric um, for that sale from our stats just simply to keep some consistency. Uh, we are reporting again only on residential MLS data. Uh, we um, do not use any public records or outside data sources. The user manual FAQ is a great resource. There's a demo video in there as well. You're also welcome to reach out to North Star MLS for further assistance. Uh, and again, their contact info is inside the user manual. And of course, you're welcome to share these reports out. Use these in your business, use this to build new business. We just ask that when you share the reports that you keep the citation at the bottom of the report that says where the data came from. Just like in college, it's always important to cite your sources. Thank you so much for coming today. Really appreciate it. And appreciate everyone sticking around here to the end. We'll stick around for another minute in case there's any final questions. Otherwise, thanks again for coming. Have a great day.